Hi everybody, Joe Conkley in the shop. We're in the machine room in the shop. Usually I'm out here at my, my workbench today. I'm in the, uh, the machine room part of the LA Instruments Repair Shop. And we are going to look today this uh, interesting 1963 Gibson LG1. Um, I'm doing a couple of repairs on it. Uh, I've been working on it for a little while. I'm doing some repairs on it. The, I needed to replace the bridge on it. This is the original bridge of an LG1 as opposed to the LG2 and LG3. The LG1 has this plastic bridge which is a pretty interesting piece. Um, you can see that there are four uh, receptacles for screws. These screws and washers will fit right in there and uh, attach the bridge to the top. Um, there is no glue. And so the plastic bridge is fairly flexible and fragile and uh, 50 years later, a lot of them do not hold up. You can see that this one cracked right there. Um, there is a lot of tension at each screw hole. Another crack, there's a crack right there. Where the pin, uh, where the bridge pins are and hold the strings on it is warped considerably and pulled up right there. So there's a lot of tension on that bridge. And that string tension is concentrated on those four points as opposed to a standard wood bridge that is glued onto the surface, that tension is spread out over that whole footprint. So, um, unfortunately, there are, are not, as far as I know, not any of these bridges that have survived, and the ones that have survived are on instruments. Um, but, uh, so this one, uh, oh, okay. um, so I replaced the plastic one with this uh, new ebony bridge. And uh, um, uh, I debated as to whether to make it a Brazilian rosewood bridge like the fingerboard or ebony, but I, I chose ebony because of the, the original black plastic bridge. And uh, uh, so there was that. Uh, I had some other um, things to decide on. This bridge has a fairly flat profile. It is flat and fairly even from treble to bass. There are no defined wings. And so there are a number of things about this. While well, I was trying to retain the flavor and look of this as much as I could, I did not want to make the same mistakes that they did again, which would cause some problems. So the first thing I did was to make sure that I got the height of the bridge correct in comparison with the neck angle. So here's a straight edge that I'm laying across the top of the fretboard. And you can see, I don't know if you can see that one, there is a teeny little bit of light there behind our, uh, uh, in between the bottom of the straight edge and the top of the bridge. That's a proper neck angle. As far as the neck angle in relationship to the, um, to the size of the bridge. When I put the string tension on, that's going to pull up a little bit, so that's why I have that little bit of space there. That ensures me that I'm going to have a nice tall saddle as far as the opportunity to cut it down over the next 50 years to maintain the action, and a nice angle and when the string comes out of the pinhole up over that saddle to get a nice downward pressure on the bridge and make the guitar sound, sound good. Um, but it's, uh, there's a window there. You can have a neck angle too steep and the bridge too small so that the saddle will be too tall or you could have the opposite going on so when I made this bridge I made sure that I got a bridge to size up with the neck angle the other thing that I wanted to make sure that I did as I mentioned it has a fairly flat profile but the original saddle which is this interesting composite material I don't know if you can see on camera see the the grain this is some sort of uh, composite but like some sort of mesh with an epoxy to to hold it together it's a pretty sturdy interesting old-school man-made material but it's not terribly sturdy it does have some flexibility too I'm gonna to put a new bone saddle in here but one of the things that I want to do with the saddle 
is I want to match the radius of the fingerboard. The fingerboard has a curve to it. And uh, I have my radius gauge here, and I've already taken a look at it, this. I, I lay my radius gauge on there. It matches up to this 10 inch radius. So I want to have a corresponding radius on my saddle. When I compare this 10 inch radius to the original saddle, let's see if we can probably see it better, like this. Um, get my fat fingers out of the way there. Anyhow, it's actually a slightly sharper radius than the 10 inch. Um, so I didn't want to use this saddle because it's not exactly correct. So that 10 inch radius on this bridge, this bridge is really flat. There's a big gap there, you can see. I'm not gonna be able to have, um, when, this, when I get the guitar set up properly, I, I want the base side of the saddle and the base side of the strings, the bass strings, to be up a little bit higher, about a 30 second inch higher than the treble side. So it's best if you have a bridge profile to match that saddle profile. Um, it's a very flat profile and it's also about the same size on treble, treble and bass, which is gonna have me to have my saddle be super tall in the middle, a little bit low on the bass side, and super low on the treble side. So I made my bridge, I modified my bridge to, ha uh, to have a little bit more radius. Not, I wasn't able to get the exact radius that I have on my fingerboard because that would look a little weird. That's too much radius to have in the bridge and have the wings look properly, but I got, I was able to get a 16 inch radius out of that bridge. So I profiled that bridge top with a 16 inch radius. That was about the most curve I could put on the bridge and have it look reasonable. And so now when I get my saddle properly sized, I will have a fairly even amount of saddle sticking on. It will still be kind of like what I described. It'll be, its tallest point will be in the middle the base side will be a little lower than that, the treble side will be a little lower than that, but not as extreme as it was on this bridge. And so uh, there'll be a little more even tension on the saddle from the strings forward. So um, I had to, in addition to just making the bridge, once I get the bridge made, I have to uh, scrape the finish off underneath the bridge in this exact profile. With screwed on bridges is screwed right onto the finish of the guitar. So I remove the finish right into this and glue that on so it takes that string tension and spreads it out over this whole footprint rather than concentrating on those four points. So another interesting part uh, or design uh, for this guitar is it is what's called a ladder braced guitar. I don't know if you can kind of get in here and look in the sound hole. You can see this first brace. It is um, parallel to the frets. It's a ladder braced. This way? Which way you want me to? Yeah. Ah. It's a little hard to tell here. We could possibly have tried to get the mirrors out and see the braces. But in any case, the braces are exactly like the back braces. Ladder braced across. So um, the bridge plate, which is a flat piece of wood that is on the other side of the bridge, and what it does is it um, it just um, makes this uh, area of the bridge where all the string tension really begins a little sturdier. It also uh, helps for the wear and tear of the bridge of the string ball ends pulling against there. It, um, they usually put a very long, like this length, and wide piece of spruce for the bridge plate. The spruce does not wear nearly as well as more standard bridge plates that folks put in made out of maple plywood or rosewood. So what you'll usually find on a guitar like this is that, and, there, and, and the grain line for that bridge place is like this. So this um, string of holes here is all on the same grain line and that wood in between here and here is all blown out and missing a little channel right there. So I put a maple bridge plate cap, about 70,000 thick, which is pretty thin, over top of that spruce bridge plate to give me to um, give me a nice area that the string ball, the string ball ends can sit against. So I've done that already. Now let's take a look at the saddle here. I've already started on the saddle a little bit. 
A 1 8 inch wide or a .125 saddle blank is pretty uh, common for uh, the Gibson guitars. Martins are usually more like 330 seconds, which is .093 inches or um, .100 tenth of an inch. But anyhow, so I've got a blank. Um, and this is pretty much what a, saddle, a bone saddle blank comes like. The one thing that I've done already is put a curve to this um, end there. So I just want to illustrate this part of it. Uh, so I've got, I had to uh, sand it to get it to fit in here. Nice. I want it to fit in um, nice and tight, but not so tight that I can't pull it out. But I rounded that end there. And um, let me see if I can illustrate this. What I'm going to try to do now is cut it to length. And I'm just sighting down into the end of the slot. And that's the, you know, I, um, so now I'm going to cut that off and sand that little round to that length. So let me see here. This is going to get noisy, so uh, I can turn the sound down a little bit so that it doesn't blow them out, but that's how it goes. So the first thing I, sorry, I'll go around you here. i got to turn the dust collector on. Noisy thing number one. Over the band saw. I'm going to adjust the uh, blade guard here. Uh, I can saw through this bone on the bandsaw here. Just cut that end off quick. And now I'm going to uh, sand that down. Let's check. I left it a little long. Take a close look here. Pretty close. I need to cut a little bit more off there. Let's do a little sanding without the dust collector on here this time because there won't be that much dust and it might save our ears here a little bit. I'm also going to start the, uh, the rounding of that. Take a little bit of the off. I have another tool that will make this a little more precise. Around the end, 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 end. Make sure I've got the bottom of the saddle marked T for treble, so that I know that that bottom, that little T goes on the bottom of that side. Still not quite fit there, but it's pretty close. Just need to take a little more off, a little more length off. Yeah, it's starting to fit in there now. I have this tool. Let me take these off for a few minutes here. Um, this is a fret crowning file. You can see that there are two curves, one on either side, two different sides. This one's a little more narrow, this one's a little wider. Or it was the other way around. Here's the narrow one, there's the wide one. But the teeth of the file are just in there. So that a lot of times is used to recrown the frets after you level them, which I've already done. But I can also use it to um, get a nice curved, even profile to the end of the saddle here and have it fit in there a little more precisely. I like that noise. That means it's fit in there nice and tight. Hopefully I can pull it out with my fingers here. Oh, it's still too tight. Almost too tight. All right, so that's a good fit to the saddle there. Now I want to do the top profile. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to mark where the two E strings will hit the saddle, or, or the two E strings will come over. I've just laid a little mark on the bone there to um, show me where the, um, this part down here is down in that slot, so I'm going to make a couple measurements here. Um, because I've done a good job of setting the bridge height and the neck angle, um, I'm looking for around four or five thirty seconds of clearance here. I know from experience that. 
So I marked that. That's how much saddle is going to be sticking out. I know I've got a 10 inch radius on the fingerboard. I'm going to use my radius gauge to draw that 10 inch radius there. There we go. So that's like the initial profiling of the saddle. So I'll sand that profile into it. Then I'll start that radius on the top. Got another tool here that, um, this is a uh, nice tool from TJ Thompson and Pro Lothier's tool that will allow me to do that radiusing on the top of the saddle a little more quickly. So now, let's, uh, I think we are gonna have to turn the dust collector on for this because this is gonna be a little more. If you were here, you could smell that, you would be able to smell that nice. Uh, it's, uh, when I do a lot of friction on the sander with a bone saddle, so it creates some heat and you get that sort of uh, protein, warm protein smell. Yummy. All right, hit the switch. On. Check it on my profile gauge. Yep, I got that to where I need now. And I already started to knock those corners off. Let's try our profiling tool. I've got three different size curves on there, and I'm gonna pitch pick one that will match good. And uh, actually, I would prefer to be able to clamp this piece of uh, bone into my, As a matter of fact, we might have to do Just that. go back. Yep. Come back. Let's go out to my bench and we will clamp this in here and show you how this cuts. This is a scraper. There is an edge on either part of this will allow me to pretty quickly remove that material. Slip it into my Vice here, nice and tight. Yeah, it was the big one, wasn't it? This one. take a little while you can see that curve starting in there you can see that the top where I sanded it is rather dull and these corners are starting to shine up from the, the cut there let's just go a little longer here give you that so once I get this radius you know the rice nice rounded corners on this I'll then put it back in the guitar and string it up once and see if I have the proper height to the bridge. And uh, chances are it'll be a little bit tall. I tried to make sure that I left enough material on there. And then I'll take it off the bottom, which I can take it off nice and square and quick to bring it down to the correct height, get the instrument all set up. a lot closer. I don't know if you can see that. Right in here I've got the full profile on her, nice rounded profile, but I'll continue that type. And I want to do it kind of like I would a fret in that I want to leave just a little bit of the center of that uh, 
not scraped to this round shape so that I can maintain that profile, just knock those corners off. And then I'll sand this up. And uh, let's take a look at that. Come here. I did bring some sandpaper in my sanding block. I'll start off with the 240 grit paper. I use this paper to get that fit too. But uh, part of what I'm looking for here is I want to clean up any of those pool marks there. I also want to knock this, it's a fairly sharp edge here. I want to knock that down and just round that up so that when your hand rests on that, it will feel reasonable, and I will go through that with the 240, 400, yep, and uh, in the end, that's pretty shiny right there, in the end, I will go and uh, polish this up on a buffer, but you can see this area right here is pretty close to being done, that area there still needs to be, as you noticed when I had it in the vise, I had this clamped and this sticking out. I'll have to flip it around so I can scrape that uh, profile, proper profile, into the saddle. When I get it all done, like I said, there's my T for treble. I pop it in there. It's a nice tight fit. Fair amount of saddle sticking out of there. That's probably, as I said, I, I left it proud on purpose so that when I string it up, I can then cut it down to a precise. A measurement here at the 12th fret. And there you go, making a saddle for an uh, 1963 LG1 after replacing that plastic bridge. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. We'll see you in a couple of weeks in the shop. I'm Joe Conley at Elder Instruments. Take care.